Good afternoon and welcome to the first part of our two-part webinar series, which provides an overview of the significant construction and adjudication cases of 2018. Our webinars will hopefully provide an understanding of the key developments in construction and adjudication practice and how these might affect your construction project disputes in 2019. This first webinar will focus on our chosen top five construction cases of 2018. So we will be highlighting the main facts and legal points from each, identifying specific lessons to be aware of for construction contracts and claims. All our webinars are recorded and are available on our Vimeo site if you are not able to join us live or would like to listen again or share with colleagues. Before we begin, there are a few housekeeping matters to address. To minimise background noise, I have placed you all on mute. If you would like to ask questions, please do so using the webinar chat function. In order to keep within 30 minutes, we will be answering as many questions as we can at the end of the presentation rather than as we go along. So I'm Nathaniel Buckingham and I work in the construction and special projects team based in Edinburgh and specialising in construction and in engineering dispute resolution. I am joined by Chiara Pieri, a solicitor who has recently joined our disputes team. Our team regularly advise on construction contract issues and disputes across a range of projects and clients. We therefore have a great deal of experience in court, arbitration and adjudication where our arguments have to reflect the ever-evolving judicial approaches to construction law and contracts. This experience forms the basis of our strategic advice and what we will share with you today. So I'll now pass you on to Chiara who will run through the agenda for today's webinar. Thanks, Nathaniel. We will start today by looking at the case of North Midland Building Limited against Sydon Homes Limited, where the English Court of Appeal decided that a contractor, having expressly agreed to a provision apportioning the risk of concurrent delays, cannot later rely on the English common law prevention principle to avoid being bound by it. We will then discuss Williams Tar Construction Limited against Anthony Roylance Limited where the English Technology and Construction Court, known as the TCC, had to decipher whether Williams Tar Construction Limited had engaged Anthony Roylance in his capacity as an individual or his company, Anthony Roylance Limited, following a rushed engagement via email. Next will be haberdashers against Lake House con contracts, where the TCC considered the rights of subcontractors to claim under a project-wide insurance policy when they have their own separate insurance in place in accordance with a term in the subcontract. We will then consider SSC generation against Hawks Teeth, in which the Court of Session looked at contractors' liability under an NEC contract, which contained both a fitness for purpose obligation and a duty to carry out the works with reasonable skill and care. Finally, we will talk about Rock Advertising Limited against MWB Business Exchange Centres, where the Supreme Court considered whether an oral agreement to vary a payment schedule was effective, given that the parties had previously agreed to include a no modification clause in the contract. While some of these cases are English, much, much of our contract law and many of the standard form contracts used for construction projects are common across the border. The English courts have a larger number of disputes and appeals than the Scottish courts, and therefore key lessons can be learned from looking at English cases, and these cases would likely be persuasive in Scottish actions. We begin with the English case of North Midland Building Limited against Sydon Homes Limited, which some of you may recall we discussed in our webinar on the top construction cases of 2017, although we noted in the webinar that the appeal was outstanding and this appeal was heard in the Court of Appeal in 2018, which we will look at today. By way of reminder, the case concerned Sydon Homes Limited, who employed a contractor, North Midland Building Limited to design and build a large house in the Midlands under a JCT design and build construction contract. The parties agreed certain bespoke amendments to the standard form contract, one of which was a clause concerning the way in which extensions of time would be dealt with. This clause became the focus of this case 
when the works were delayed and the contractor applied for an extension of time, or an EOT. The clause stated that, in considering an EOT, any delay caused by a relevant event which is concurrent with another delay for which the contractor is responsible shall not be taken into account. A concurrent delay is a delay period which occurs because of more than one separate but concurrent event, one that is the fault of the contractor and one that is the fault of the employer. The delay in this case was a concurrent delay as a delay which was the fault of the contractor arose at the same time as a delay which was the fault of Sidon Homes, the employer. The question asked in both the Technology and Construction Court in 2017 and the Court of Appeal last year was whether this delay entitled the contractor to an extension to the contractual completion date. Sidon Homes maintained that, reading the clause exactly as written, the concurrent delay meant the contractor was not entitled to any EOT. The contractor agreed that the language of the amended clause was clear. However, the contractor sought to strike down the clause by reference to the English common law principle known as the prevention principle, whereby one party cannot enforce a contractual obligation against the other where it has prevented the other party from complying with that obligation. Therefore, as the contractor argued in this case, the employer prevented the contractor from completing the works by the completion date through the concurrent delay event and could therefore not rely on the clause that denied an extension due to concurrent delay. The Court of Appeal, agreeing with the TCC decision in 2017, held that the express contractual term allowing Sidon Homes to levy liquidated damages for periods of concurrent delay took precedence over the prevention principle. This appeal case therefore reiterates the valuable lessons learned from the TCC's judgment in 2017. Firstly, the case confirmed that exclusions on concurrent delay will be upheld in England, meaning that provisions allocating concurrency risk are enforceable and parties are free to agree whatever terms they wish to agree. Additionally, clear and unambiguous terms such as those allocating delay concurrency risks when expressly agreed between the parties carry significant weight and can override common law principles. The courts will almost always adhere to those expressed terms as long as they are unambiguous in preference to implied terms or common law principles and will maintain that the parties are bound by them. This was e this is, that is equally as relevant in both Scotland and England. We mentioned in our 2017 webinar that there may be an increase in the use of this type of clause in construction contracts following the TCC's judgment. It is even more likely now that employers, having gained reassurance from the Court of Appeal that an express provision allocating concurrent delay risk will be upheld, will attempt to include such provisions as, a, as an amendment to the standard form contracts which are usually silent on concurrent delay. Therefore, contractors must ensure they are fully aware of the consequences of such provisions, as the Court of Appeal confirmed that they will not be able to rely on the prevention principle to escape from them once included in the contract. They will ultimately be bound by them if an issue regarding concurrent delay later arises. Certainty and clarity are therefore both key when drafting such provisions. Next, we will consider the English case of Williams Tower Construction Limited against Anthony Roylands Limited. So, in this case, Williams Tower Construction, or WTC, was the main contractor on a housing development project and engaged construction site services as its subcontractor. WTC engaged either Anthony Roylands in his capacity as an individual chartered civil engineer or Anthony Roylands Limited, a company that he had formed and controlled to provide civil engineering works. These works included constructing a retaining wall. The wall was defective due to unexpected ground conditions and required urgent remedial works. A dispute then arose as to who had entered into a contract with whom, as the parties disagreed on whether WC, WTC sorry, engaged Anthony Roylands in his capacity as an individual or Anthony Roylands Limited, his company. WTC believed it had engaged Anthony Roylands to design a solution to the wall issues to ensure it was fit for purpose 
whilst Anthony Roylance argued that WTC had contracted with his company to simply design a drain for the wall and denied any obligation to ensure the wall was fit for purpose. If Anthony Roylance had been engaged in his capacity as an individual, he would be personally exposed in terms of liability, something that his limited company was set up to specifically avoid. No formal written contract had been produced. The appointment was made simply through a number of emails. WTC argued that it was not clear he was appointing Anthony Roylance Limited because the emails were sent to Anthony Roylance's personal email address. Also, the professional indemnity insurance was in Anthony Roylance's name, not the company's, and he had requested the checks for the invoices be made out to Anthony Roylance. The TCC was tasked with having to scrutinise every piece of correspondence between the parties and to listen to various witnesses in order to ascertain what the parties had agreed and between whom. This was particularly difficult as the majority of documents were generally very unclear. So the court ultimately held that WTC had engaged Anthony Roylance in his capacity as an individual. However, as the engagement had been in writing via emails, the court was able to consider the natural meaning of the words used and the context to decide what had been agreed, thereafter concluding that Anthony Roylance had not been required to warrant that the wall was fit for purpose, only to design a solution. WTC was therefore unsuccessful in claiming breach of contract and breach of warranty. A valuable lesson to learn from this case is the importance of recording exactly what has been agreed during contractual negotiations. The necessary time must be taken to carefully draft an agreement which is understood and agreed by both parties. In this case, WTC accepted that the engagement was a bit of a rushed job because they were desperate to find a solution to the wall problems. As a result, Anthony Roylance was found personally liable, though the claim failed against him without the protection of acting under a limited company. Whilst it may seem as though a speedy appointment is the best option when a solution is required Im imminently, the benefits of this do not outweigh the issues that a lack of clarity can cause further down the line. This is especially true in the construction industry with the regular issue of latent defects. Similarly, the case stresses that it is not enough to simply agree matters informally, even if it is done in writing because misunderstandings and miscommunications can arise when the process is rushed, which can make it very difficult to decipher what the parties intended at a later stage. A key point to note from this case was the parties' failure to remember specific details of their earlier communication, which, having not been in writing, were impossible to recall during the court action. This is one of the main benefits of having expressly agreed terms set out in writing in a contract. It removes the burden of having to recall exactly what was agreed, when it was agreed, and between whom. Thank you, Nathaniel. We will now look at the English, English case of Haberdashers Asks Federation Trust against Lake House Contracts. Haberdashers operated and owned a school Lakehouse was appointed as the main contractor for an extension to the school and subcontracted <coughs> Cambridge Polymer Roofing for Roofing Works. There was project-wide insurance in place covering Lakehouse and their subcontractors. As can be seen on the slide, Clause 6.1 of the subcontract between Lakehouse and Cambridge lists everything for which Cambridge was liable. Clause Clause 6.2 stated that Cambridge were to obtain their own insurance cover, in this case £5 million, which they did. A fire broke out at the school caused by the subcontractor Cambridge, which caused significant damage and, as a result, haberdashers sought damages from Lakehouse. The claim settled for £8.75 million, paid by the project insurers. Lakehouse then sought a contribution or indemnity from Cambridge to recover up to £5 million under Cambridge's own insurance. Cambridge sought a declaration that they could rely on the project-wide insurance. They argued that they were covered under the project-wide insurance, notwithstanding the term in their subcontract that they were to obtain their own insurance, as the subcontractors of Lakehouse, a group covered under the, the project-wide policy. 
the TCC had to determine whether Cambridge was entitled to cover under the project-wide insurance policy and whether Lake House could recover from Cambridge under their own insurance policy. The court held that Cambridge were not protected under the project-wide insurance as they had provided their own contractual indemnity insurance backed by separated insurance cover. As the contract expressly stated that Cambridge were to have their own insurance, they could not be a beneficiary of the project-wide insurance. Lakehouse were therefore allowed to recover the losses they incurred as a result of their settlement with haberdashers from Cambridge. The court stressed that the key point was the intention of the parties, especially the intention of the subcontractor. Cambridge agreed to a subcontract that expressly required them to obtain their own insurance, which means from the court's objective view, the intention must have been for Cambridge to use their own insurance and not rely on the project-wide policy. One of the main points that should be taken from this case is that subcontractors cannot assume they will be covered under project-wide insurance simply because subcontractors as a general grouping are covered under a policy. That does not give rise to a right under the insurance policy unless the subcontract itself conveys that right. Confusingly, project insurance policies are usually promoted in terms of their cover extending to subcontractors. However, this judgment has confirmed that subcontractors will not be entitled to cover under such a policy if they agree to their own insurance under a subcontract in respect of separate terms. Subcontractors should therefore be aware of the primacy of express terms in their subcontracts as the court will turn to these terms as a matter of construing the contract when making a judgment. Another point to note from this case is that subcontractors will, understandably, be less likely to accept insurance obligations that affect their cover under a project-wide insurance policy. In any event, a number of project-wide insurance policies, including the one in this case, include a waiver of subrogation term, which a subcontractor will not benefit from if they are not a beneficiary of the project policy. The case therefore also confirmed that if a subcontractor has their own insurance, they may be opening themselves up to subrogated claims from project insurers in the event a loss occurs on a project, even if the loss in question is one which is covered under the project-wide insurance policy. Therefore, subcontractors should proceed with caution when agreeing, when agreeing terms in their subcontracts and ensuring they are aware of how the terms may interfere with their cover under the project-wide insurance. The next case is a Scottish one this time, um, SSC Generation against Hockteef Solutions AG. Now, many of you will be familiar with parts of this case from, a, from our previous webinars and seminars. But as a reminder, SSE engaged Hockteef under an NEC2 contract to design, construct and commission a hydroelectric scheme in Gwendo. The contract contained a fitness for purpose obligation on Hockteef that the tunnel would not collapse for 75 years. Option M in the contract also specified that design liability would be limited to the use of reasonable skill and care. SSE took over the works from Hockteef in December 2008. In April 2009, the head race tunnel, which formed part of the Glendo hydroelectric scheme, collapsed. Hockteef refused to carry out any remedial work, claiming that the works were carried out with reasonable skill and care, so they met their contractual obligations. As a result, SSE had to engage a third party to do the work, which amounted to approximately $107 million, and then raised proceedings against Hockteef to recover that loss. The Court of Session considered a number of issues, such as what caused the tunnel to collapse, if there was a defect, and whether the defect was one that Hockteef would be liable for. The court also had to consider how the contract should be interpreted, given the fact it contained both a duty to carry out the design work with reasonable skill and care, and a fitness for purpose obligation. In the first instance, in the first uh, court action decided in 2016, the single judge had agreed that Hockteef was not liable because they had exercised reasonable skill and care in preparing the design, which, in the words of the judge, placed an important break on liability. However, on appeal in 2018, the inner house of the Court of Session reversed this decision. The appeal court held that, first of all, there was a defect. 
Secondly, that the defect was not a result of the contractor's design works. So therefore, Hockatief had complied with its duty to use reasonable skill and care in the preparation of the design. But thirdly, rather that the defect resulted from how the design had been implemented. That meant that the reasonable skill and care break on liability did not engage at all because this was not a pure design issue. Accordingly, the inner house of the court session held that Hockatief were liable, even though they had complied with their duty to use reasonable skill and care in design, because the defect was in the implementation of design and not the design itself, which had to meet the 75-year fitness for purpose obligation. A key issue to note in this case is how contentious the fitness for purpose obligation versus reasonable skill and care consideration can be for design and build contracts. This case suggests that the courts will look to divide up clearly what is design and what is build, and perhaps only pure design issues will be subject to the lesser reasonable skill and care obligation. As such, it is important for contractors to appreciate that when there are fitness for purpose obligations in a contract, carrying out other ancillary duties, which may only require reasonable skill and care, may not be sufficient to avoid liability for defects. Another important lesson from this case is in terms of drafting. There must be a clear distinction between what elements of the works is design and which are related to implementation of the design and also construction. A failure to recognise this distinction resulted in over 100 million of liability for Hockatief. <coughs> the final case we will look at today is the English case of Rock Advertising Limited against MWB Business Exchange Centres Limited. In this case, Rock Advertising entered into a licence with MWB Business Exchange Centres to occupy office space for a fixed term of 12 months. The licence contained a clause expressly agreed by the parties known as a no oral modification clause, or sometimes known as a no oral variation clause. This is a standard clause which states that any variation to the contract must be set out in formal writing and signed on, be on behalf of both parties in order to be valid. The issue in this case rose when Rock fell into payment arrears of over £12,000 and Rock's director proposed a revised payment schedule to a credit controller employed by MWB. He proposed that part of the upcoming payments would be deferred and the arrears would be spread over the remainder of the licence term. Rock claimed that MWB had orally agreed to vary the licence as per the revised payment schedule whereas MWB considered the schedule only a proposal which it had rejected. MWB locked Rock out of the premises, terminated the licence and sued Rock for their arrears. As Rock was under their permission, the revised payment schedule had been agreed orally, they counterclaimed for wrongful exclusion from the premises. The question for the Supreme Court was whether or not the oral agreement between Rock's director and MWB's credit controller to vary the payment schedule was effective, despite the fact it breached the requirement of the no oral mod modification clause that both parties had expressly agreed to. The five Supreme Court judges who heard the appeal unanimously agreed that the no oral modification clause must be observed, thereby invalidating any oral agreement to vary the payment schedule. The court held that even when parties agree an oral, an oral variation in spite of a no oral modification clause, that does not necessarily mean they intended to dispense with the clause or that oral variations are forbidden. Instead, the court considered that the natural inference from the party's failure to observe the formal requirements of a no oral modification clause is not that they intended to dispense with it, but that they overlooked it. The court therefore took the view that the parties were bound by the no oral modification clause, giving weight to their intention to validly bind themselves as to how future changes in their re legal relations were to be achieved. This decision undoubtedly has practical implications for the drafting and agreeing of, agreeing of contracts. Most importantly, the case confirmed that no oral modification clauses are effective and will be upheld by the courts. This is likely to be persuasive in Scotland. 
The inclusion of such a clause is a means of providing more certainty for contracting parties when expressly agreeing to contractual terms, as these terms cannot later be varied informally by oral means. Therefore, for large and complex construction contracts, it is worth including this clause in order to ensure the parties' intentions are protected further down the line. Similar to what we have discussed in earlier cases today, an important lesson from this case is the importance of parties ensuring they fully agree with the terms being included in construction contracts and that those terms reflect their intentions. Certain terms, by their very nature, benefit one party more than the other, so it is important that, when negotiating the contract, the parties do understand the consequences of agreeing to certain clauses and appreciate that they will be bound by them if a dispute arises later. A no oral modification clause provides even less room for escaping obligations expressly agreed. The Court stressed the importance of following the formal procedures for varying terms set out in the contract itself if both parties intend to make amendments to the contract. Finally, given the weight the contract in this case placed on the party's initial intention when agreeing to include the no oral modification clause, it reminds us again how reluctant the courts are to stray from what parties have expressly agreed. Thank you, Kiara. So, what, what can we take away from today's webinar? Firstly, the cases have reiterated the importance of careful and clear drafting from the outset, ensuring that both parties fully understand and agree to the terms incorporated into a construction contract. Similarly, the parties must be aware that they are bound by the terms they agree. The cases today have highlighted particularly the Court's willingness, when interpreting a contract, to hold parties to the terms they expressly agreed, particularly when the terms are clear and unambiguous. So we have now come to the end of this webinar. Thank you for listening. Um, we do hope it has been useful and interesting. We still have a few minutes to answer any questions, so if you haven't done so already, please do type your questions into the chat box now. While you are doing that, I will just take the opportunity to remind you that the second webinar in this series will take place on Tuesday, the 19th of February at 1 p.m. This will be a roundup of our chosen top five adjudication cases of 2018. And again, we will consider the factual background, legal points, and lessons to be learned from each case. So if you haven't signed up for this already, then please do so by visiting the news and events section of our website. And as I said at the beginning, this webinar has, has been recorded and will be available on our Vimeo site shortly. So if you know of any colleagues who haven't been able to participate today, or if you think this will be useful for anyone, then please let them know. We will be circulating details of the recording to participants after the webinar. And I'm just having a look. So we do have a couple of questions. Uh, and the first one, actually, this is a, a good question. So you probably, we talked about the Glen Doe project earlier, SSE generation against Hockety Solutions, um, which has just been appealed um, to the uh, inner house, and that's what we talked about today. Um, the question is, um, has, uh, is this case going to the Supreme Court? Is it going to be appealed? And the answer is uh, yes. Um, they have been granted leave to appeal, uh, so it will, that case will continue to rumble onwards into the Supreme Court. Um, there aren't any dates for that yet, but uh, inevitably the next step uh, in that long-running case will be decided then in front of the Supreme Court, and it will no doubt form uh, the basis of future webinars and seminars when we have a decision on that um, at some point in the future. Um, and the second question, uh, this is a good question actually, which is um, given the haberdashers case that we just ex uh, explored and explained, w what is the point of project-wide insurance and when is it useful? Um, and, and that is a good question. I mean, I think the haberdashers case was um, certainly an example of when project-wide insurance was being used but perhaps hadn't been fully thought through or hadn't been fully utilised. Now, project-wide insurance can be um, a great attribute to a project where uh, the cost of that insurance um, across the whole project and across all contractors and subcontractors can be taken out, and that can be quite a cost-effective way of insuring a particular project um, or, or event. 
Now, when it's useful is um, the simple answer to that is it's useful when it's thought about uh, and it's and it's decided to use that from the start of a project um, and it's decided to use that across. Uh, all, all of the issues or all of the potential issues and all of the potential tiers of subcontractors. So what I would say is if project-wide insurance is to be used, um, the first thing is to, to think about and know when it is to be made available, um, to think about what it's going to cover, who it's going to cover, and to make sure that is then articulated, um, not just in the project-wide insurance documents, but throughout any of the contractual documents down the chain. Now, an advantage of that is, um, I suppose, that in this case, the haberdasher's case, the subcontractor's insurance, the cost of the subcontractor providing insurance could have been avoided. So there can be cost savings of having project-wide insurance rather than every subcontractor providing their own insurance, but um, obviously only if it's used in the way that I've suggested. So, so the answer is it's very useful or can be very useful and appropriate when it's planned. Um, and as I said at the start, haberdasher's case is an example of the sort of issues that can arise when, um, when that sort of planning is, is not thought about and when you do end up with multiple different types of insurance across the project and down the subcontract tiers. And that's, um, those are the questions that we've had, um, and our time is up for today as well. So I do hope that you have enjoyed this webinar and found it informative and useful, and we look forward to welcoming you to our next webinar in February, when we will look at last year's top adjudication cases. Thank you.